step by step, the Lord will lead us and that we might be able to follow in all of his ways. That was the meditation that the hymn that we sing. It gives us a time of reflection. And uh, what we normally like to do is convert that into a form of a prayer individually as you sing it. Because each time you attend a morning worship service, an evening service, a Wednesday time that you spend in the Word of God is a step-by-step process. And so here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. That is how we grow. And that is the value of a worship service, the preaching of the Word. On a Sunday morning, it's a little bit more uh, expository, probably a little bit more intense. Some of the other times that we meet together is more as a, a study uh, format, but nevertheless, there's the opportunity of the application of Scripture to our hearts. So this morning, uh, the subject's going to be that of effective prayer, or as James put, the effectual prayer, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so there will be two locations in our scriptures I'd like for you to turn to today. The first is going to be found in James chapter 5, and uh, James chapter 5, and that of verse 17. James chapter 5 and verse 17. And then we'll turn to 1 Kings chapter 18, and only look, observe two verses there, 36 and 37. Now as we read this, you'll notice right away that the two texts of scripture are immediately associated with each other, and uh, they'll, we'll make the connection. James chapter 5, beginning of verse 17, Elias was a man, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth for the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and heaven gave rain. The earth brought forth her fruit, brethren, if any of you do err from truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converts a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. You back up to verse 16, you, you read the words, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And that is our theme for the day. So he cites Elijah as the uh, model as the illustration, probably we could, always, we could actually say he's the icon of effective prayer. No man has been able to match uh, the powerful impact of prayer such as what Elijah did. I don't know anywhere else in the scripture whereby uh, the rain would cease for three years and six months. And then again calls it to rain uh, by each, by virtue of Elijah's prayer. Now, the only thing that might match that is in a battle that uh, Gideon was facing, and he asked, it was Gideon or Joshua, one of those two, and he asked the sun and the moon to stand still. So I guess there is a match to it, if I think about it. But nevertheless, these were both godly men, and one of the characteristics of each was, was uh, that of their prayer life. Now, if you would, let's turn to 1 Kings in chapter 18. And verse 36 and 37, context, we find that uh, the altar was built uh, by Baal and his prophets. Elijah steps in after a full day of ranting and, and uh, chanting and bleeding all over the place. No fire from heaven came down to burn up the sacrifice from Baal. So now it's Elijah's turn. Elijah saturates the, uh, uh, the altar, puts a trench around it fills the trenches with water, and then, rather than ranting and raving and chanting and singing and cutting himself, he uses two verses, approximately 166 words, calls fire down from heaven. Notice the prayer, verse 36 of chapter 18 of 1 Kings. And it came to pass at the time of the evening offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God, Abraham, Isaac of Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all of these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Remarkable. And then, shortly after that, before the sun sets, there was a thunderstorm. 
That is effective prayer. Well, let's pray, if we will, and ask God that uh, he would answer our prayer and speak to our hearts on this subject. Because, Father, we are a weak and feeble people. We have many distractions that are entered into our lives. And so if time to time we have to rehearse, we have to review uh, what it is about our prayer life that might be ailing. And so we go to men like Elijah and we find that the, what is necessary in order to see you actually work and to do things. It is of our concern, it's our heart desire uh, that petitions that we bring before the throne of grace would receive your ear and it would act upon them. And maybe by the end of this service, Lord, our hearts will be turned to be more earnest, more fervent, more serious about their, our prayer time, the nature of our prayer, the conduct of our lives, and much more. And we glean all this from this man, this prophet, this special prophet, Elijah. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's just take into consideration where we are at today as a church, as church families. And by that, not only our church families, but also our school, members of our school uh, teachers and staff. And that is, there's almost like, uh, it's almost like Oregon weather. I lived up in Oregon for about four months, and I never want to live there again. I did it the worst time of the year. It was in January, December, January, February, and March. It rained every day, I think maybe five days. It didn't out of 90. It's just gloomy and horrible. The highest rate of depression happens up there. You're, you're wet, all the time wet. We were contractors. We worked outside. We thought we could just go home and it rained, and when we went back in, the guy says, oh, no. He says, we work in the rain all the time. You make sure you have protection for all of that electronics that you're going to be working on. And it's just a gloomy atmosphere, drizzle, wet air all the time. And I do believe that there's, a, there's that kind of an atmosphere that is happening in our families. And the teaching staff, last week, it's almost I was like borderline, I'm glad there's not another day. Because somebody passed away, somebody losing an eye, uh, a, a suicide, a hospital emergency. And... You could just sense the atmosphere getting darker and darker. Let's just move into our, the, in our own congregation. Uh, Chris, dad, George, is, uh, praise the Lord for sharp doctors and everything at age 89, going into the hospital for a heart valve a transplant, Never, it's remarkable as it is, nevertheless. My own mother's in the hospital even now, we don't know why, probably pneumonia even as we speak. Mrs. Morrissey has been on a journey of uh, almost recovery, two steps forward, one step back, so that means one step at a time. And that's been going on since before Thanksgiving, two months now. Uh, and let me look at my list. I wrote all this down. Um, your nephews that were in the accident during the time of a funeral where George lost two brothers in the same day while he's in the doctor's office for his own heart. You see what I'm saying? These are hard, these are difficult times. And when we take all that into consideration, there's a phrase that oftentimes is used. And I think we mean well when we say it. And what is that? We are praying for you. So we have the terminology. We have the intention. And I would give everybody the benefit of the doubt that there is some manner of prayer that is being ta that has taken place. But what is our desire? What is our purpose of those prayers? That is, that we'd like to see God work and do that, which is good, bring about healing, bring about honor to his name, bring about uh, uh, health and hope and faith and so much more. We look forward to a prayers being answered. But do we prepare ourselves to receive those kind of benefits? That's what we observe when we look at the life of Elijah when he prayed, that he, he gives us several lessons of what is ne necessary if we're going to have, as James entitled it, a, an effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, it would be easy to draw an outline down off of James, but that's not our book. We're in 1 Kings. But what James cites is the only recorded prayer of Elijah in regards to that rain. 
And so therefore, we can look at that text because it's part of our lesson series and, and glean lessons from that that should and I hopefully will bring about uh, effective prayer. You see, prayer is the appointed means that God has given to us whereby we can gain access before the throne of grace. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we can obtain mercy and help in our time of need. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. It's also a channel. It's a channel whereby we seek grace and mercy because there are times that's what we need more than anything else. To change the language a little bit, look at it as an avenue. It's the avenue by which we make known our uh, petitions to heaven and we bring our requests before the throne of grace. But the question arises, are our prayers being heard? I would venture to say yes. The Bible teaches us that the ears of the Lord are, are upon the righteous. But the ears of the Lord listening does not necessarily always imply that the, God is answering. And it could very well be that many prayers do go up that God hears, but he has good reason not to respond. Let me give you by this being prepared with effective prayer. Why? Because we want to see results. We want to see God do something. And, and then we look at the reasons why. But let me give you a couple of illustrations. You ever go on a road trip? Do you ever travel overseas? We do our road trips every year. And I go through this, uh, it's almost like 100 points of preparation for the truck, for the camper, oil change, tire pressure, pulleys, belts, and you name it. You take into consideration, you think about what are all the possible scenarios that could go wrong. And you try to prepare for those kind of things because the interstate is no place. I've done it, but it is no place to actually be doing mechanical work. If you're going to travel overseas, you want a passport. If you don't have a passport, you've got to go through meticulous work and fill out the application. And why? Because you want that passport. You want a safe journey. If you're on a, a soccer team, and uh, your team is in it for, uh, to win the games, and you want the championship, you pay attention to details, and you work on those details, honing skills, kicking the ball, endurance, running back and forth, knowing what the other players are doing, and all of that is rehearsed over and over and again. Why? We want the victory. You see, we, when we come to prayer, we want the answers, but do we indulge ourselves in the details that pretty much give us promise that God will do something if we follow particular patterns that are set forth for us. The greatest one is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10 and forward, where Jesus teaches the disciples, in this manner pray ye, not as babbling fools of the Pharisees, but Jesus then gave like about five or six points that you could follow in a prayer process. Our Father in heaven... Honoring God's name, thy will, God's will be done, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So we looked at five things right there. And then give us this day our daily bread. All of these are expressions of the things that are important to God and necessary for us. And so if we want to see God work, we would want to follow Jesus' teaching on prayer so that we could have the ear of God. So Conclusion to the introduction. Isn't that a good note? Effective prayer requires diligent observation of at least three elements. At least three. This is not all the elements that would apply, but there are three that I gleaned from this this morning. Three elements, three lessons, three principles that we want to observe and we want to give good attention to them from Elijah's prayer out of 36 and 37. Number one, I'm going to give you them in order, and then we'll go through them. Number one is communion with God. Taking that time, to spending time with God. We observe that because in verse 36, it says, and it came to pass at the time of the evening sacrifice. That was a special time set apart for Israel. Secondly, the concern for God's glory. That was Elijah's master piece of concern. Will God be honored? And we read that. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. Not that I'm the special man here. 
that I'm going to bring fire down from heaven, watch me. He wasn't going to sell pieces of rock and try and make money or have people call in like we have on the televangelists today. It wasn't about he, the speaker, or he, the actor. It was all about God who would be the primary actor. God, concern for God's glory. And then thirdly, the character of our heart, the condition of our heart, as Elijah would say, and that I am your servant. He does these things, be it known this day, and as we learn in our Sunday school lesson, when you see uh, the two that's, be it known to this day, that thou art God, God's glory, and that I am thy servant. He wanted to show people what it was really like to be a true Israelite. All right, let's look at these one at a time, the first one being this, the communion with God. We have to ask ourselves, what is that? Because there's this little insert here, and it came to time, the pass at the time of the evening sacrifice. Genesis, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 29 gives us all the detail that we will need, and then Psalm 141. But in Exodus chapter 29, beginning at verse uh, 38, pay attention to um, what, what is happening here. Exodus 29, beginning at verse 38. Now this is this, which thou shalt offer upon the, off, uh, be, uh, upon the altar, the two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. One lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer in the evening. And with one lamb a tenth deal of flour mingled with a fourth part a hin of beaten oil and a fourth part of a hin of wine for a drink offering. It's just the formula for what would be known later on known as the meal offering. And the other lamb thou shalt offer in the evening and, the, and shalt do there according to the meat offering of the morning and according to the drink offering uh, thereof for a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you and speak with you there. That's the main thought. The morning offering and the evening offering, the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice, was a time where God would meet the people, the children of Israel, meet with Moses. And that would happen every day of the week. And then you go to verse uh, 43. There I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory, and I will sanctify the tabernacle and sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister uh, to me in the priest offering. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and be their God, that they may know that I am the Lord, their God, which brought them out of Egypt. So here is this evening sacrifice. This was not something new. Here, the writer inserts it there as if everybody knew that. And so this evening sacrifice, that it was time for that. Elijah seizes the opportunity, but what's the big deal? It was that time of communion. It was a time, uh, it was a daily meeting of the priest and the offer and Israel uh, to be able to, to meet with God. Our scripture this morning was found in Psalm 141, and here in verse 2, listen to these words, let my prayer be set forth upon thee as incense at the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Circle that word incense, because that is just latent with truth. That I'll just give you a little bit of it here this morning. That incense was not something they pulled off from uh, essential oils. They bought it in a package to put it there on the fire so that the smoke would smell good. The incense was a special formula that God gave the recipe for. And, and, and so the men of the apothecary would develop these uh, oils and this perfume. And some of that was then used and put on the offering. And so the sweetness of that would go upward. But the point is the preparation. It wasn't just any old stuff to make the smoke smell good. No hickory chips. No, nothing coming from Sonny's barbecue so that it makes you hungry when you drive down the street. It was a special formula but you get the picture, but it's a preparation for that. So before the incense could be offered, there was the preparation of it, and that's what I want you to understand. Communion with God is a time of that daily 
fellowship, that daily relationship with the Lord, whereby there are at least two elements that are involved. Any time there was a sacrifice, it immediately implies the notion of sin and atonement and forgiveness and pardon. And so the daily evening sacrifice would be another way of saying, Lord, make note of my failures on this day. Where did I go wrong? What did I do right? How can I fix the problem tomorrow? And then the confession of those sins, asking God to cleanse me, O God, purge my heart with hyssop, make me whiter than snow, as the psalmist David would say. And that's all part of this time of spending time with God, the confession of sins. And then also, as David would write in Psalm 142 and verse 2, he daily would bring his complaints. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed him before my trouble. So personal anguish and sorrow and hurts and burdens. That's all part of the daily. And this was a time, as we read in Psalm 141, God meets with Moses, God would meet with the people, and he would confirm his dwelling place with them. That's out of the Exodus passage, those three thoughts. The pressing question would be this, knowing that if we're going to have effectual, fervent prayer of righteous man, and by the way, when you read that text, that is not the effectual, fervent prayer because you are of a believer, avails much. Sometimes we get that mixed up. Do you understand what I'm saying here? If you read about righteousness in the book of Romans, it's a forensic righteousness. You've been declared righteousness, so you are made right in the presence of God. And so Paul writes his theology of righteousness as in that which is given to us through faith in Jesus Christ. We are declared righteous in the sight of God. That's Romans. That is salvation. It will never change. But then James takes the same subject and addresses the problem of not living righteously, not living right because you are a believer. Shall I say this? You're not living right because you have been made right. The expectation is that it's going to spill over into your life. And so when James uses that expression, the fervent, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, James is using the word righteous in the context of the whole book, whereby he's addressing uh, the, uh, the workless faith. And he wants the people to know that yes, effective can be and fervent, it only avails. You can pray all you want, you can steam at the ears, you can shout and sing and dance. But unless there's righteous living, there is no effective prayer. That's what we want. And so the first point would be that, having that communion with God. Secondly would be our concern for God's glory. You notice in our text in Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 18, there he says, let it be known that thou art God in Israel. All right, so let's talk about our prayer life. First thing we realize is that we have to engage daily a time, a special time with God, communing with Him, preparing our hearts, etc., etc. And now, in our prayer time, what is our chief concern? Circle that word in your mind. What is our chief concern? The Westminster Confession would put it that our chief concern of man is to live and do all things for the glory and the honor of God, that he receives all the credit. He was acknowledged as the one that brought everything to pass in your life. And so when Elijah prays, let it be known. He wants God to display his power. But he wants the knowledge of that glory, the knowledge of the sovereign, eternal God above all. Let it be known to Israel. Why? Because for all of these years, not just three and a half years, but many years prior to that, they, they've been going astray. They converted to Baalism, and there were a few that did not, but nevertheless, most of them did. And so Elijah wants to bring back God into the sanctuary, him back into their hearts. And so he has a God-centered concern. 
you have turned their hearts back again. That is a work of God. Let me just give you two thoughts on this. When we talk about God-centered concern Wednesday night, the one that we just looked at was when Jesus said, in like manner, you prayed this way, our Father who art in heaven, that's his location, hallowed be thy name. Sanctified be thy name. Honored be thy name. Let it be special. Let it be high and lifted up. So that that name would be the name that is above all names and all of the earth. Some of the hymns that we sing express that. And so Jesus would teach us that when we pray that God's name and his actions and his position would be exalted above all else. In the context of Jesus' lessons on prayer, the first part is the concerns of God. God is concerned about the glory of his own name and the glory of his own son. And so that's how he taught. Elijah shared that even before Jesus taught it. That Jesus, that God would be exalted, that God would be honored, that he would be obeyed by Israel, he'd be worshipped by Israel, that thy kingdom come, that he would be the king of their hearts. Even though they had a monarchy, God was still a theocracy. He always will be. And he wanted the people to surrender their hearts to him. It's a God-centered concern. So our prayer time, now let's just back up a little bit. What are we concerned about? The fog the Oregon rainy season that we are in, dark times, times of despair, and I, I think it was twice this past week, prayer chain, you, you get them. We get a phone call. So the, the prayer chain is, is starting to get ramped up, and we pray. But the only way that we can expect to see God actually work is, number one, when we ourselves, as individuals, commune with God in the morning prayer, the evening prayer. Start your day out with God and your day with God. You fill in the details. Secondly, that our prayer, Lord, whatever happens, we don't know the outcome. When we say, thy will be done, it's an expression of faith. It's an expression of surrender. We want God to make sure that he, above all, however he does it, receives all the honor. Secondly, that you have turned their hearts toward God. The, act of very, the very act of repentance, the change of heart, is a work of God within every Israelite, with every, within every individual that comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that comes to know Jesus as their Savior. You don't do that on your own. God brings that about. And so Elijah prayed that to let them know that you have turned their hearts back again, where it used to be. And so... What do we look, make of this by way of application? When we're concerned about God's glory, then we're also concerned about how he's going to change hearts and make hearts stronger and strengthen and looking more toward him. We must also observe this, that a God-centered concern comes uh, from humble hearts. Notice the language that I am your servant. You see, Jesus taught us, uh, Paul taught us in Philippians chapter 2, that uh, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Why did he say that? Because in the, in the first two verses, he mentions this, that we go about as believers esteeming others better than ourselves, lifting another person up, to a higher status, a higher regard, treating others, esteeming others as more important than yourself. That's an act of humility. And he calls us then to humble ourselves. And he presents to us the example of Jesus. That's why we would read in uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7 uh, that uh, Jesus would do this. He would come down from heaven. He would empty himself but made himself of no reputation, that is, he emptied himself of his glory and his honor and the majesty that was his with the angels and took upon him the form of a servant, humanity, and was made in the likeness of men. You see, that is humility. And when we call upon God to do something, 
we wanted him to be honored. So people say, that thing is of God. We mentioned that in Sunday school this morning. That man, Jimmy, 17 years uh, in, a, in a painful journey from totally being wrecked out of a motorcycle and now walking, being able to get out and soon to have his driver's license. First John chapter 5 and verse 14 talks about that when we ask petitions of him, we have the confidence that he will answer us according to his will. When we ask according to his will. And so when we use that, we make that statement, that's another way of saying, not my will be done, but your will be done, so that God is honored by the answer to that prayer. Our third observation this morning. So we have our communion with God. We are concerned with God. Who gets the credit? God's glory. Thirdly, the character of our heart or the condition of our heart. We might even say, what is my attitude during our prayer time? Fast and furious, just get enough out there that it meets the criteria for time of devotion. Now, listen, uh, I'll make a note of this. Verse 36 to 37 is a very short prayer, and it brought down rain. So it's not the length of the prayer that really matters. It's the sincerity. It's the fervency. It's the depth. It's the condition of the heart. It's the communion with God. It's the concern for God's glory, the concern for God's people. So those are the factors whereby prayers can be abbreviated when all of the prerequisites are met. And that's what we see here. And Elijah demonstrates to us the proper character, the proper condition of the heart. I am your servant, and at thy word I've done these things. Number one, what is going to bring about an effective prayer is that of a surrendered heart. A surrendered heart is necessary. Word, it's it's uh, whatever you, Lord, according to your will. That's, that's how James, in the practical elements of righteousness, who warned people of being presumptuous. I'm going to wake up tomorrow. We're going to go do business downtown, open up the hardware store, buy, sell, and trade. We're going to come home at the end of the day with a profit margin. James says, you ought not do that. It's foolishness. That is sin, my brethren. But you'd rather say, Lord willing, we will go do business. We will trade, and we will sell nuts and bolts and parts. And then we will come home, Lord willing. In other words, the day of business and the affairs of life are in the hands of God. And so the character of the heart is I am surrendered to whatever God wants to bring to pass. That's tough. I'm not saying it's easy. But if we have an attitude that we deserve and God's going to answer because we are adopted into his family. That's not necessarily true. Legally, we are a child of God. Now, for those of you who are parents, you know yourself that just because that child is yours doesn't mean they're going to get everything they want. Sometimes we use bargaining chips, ice cream. You want some ice cream? Yeah. Well, then go clean your room. No, then you don't get ice cream. You see how that works? Well, we look at this. Uh, we... God says, you, you act the right way, you live the right way, have a heart and an attitude of submission. He's not giving us bargaining chips. He's saying, this is the way it works. Because we can never just assume that we're going to get it. A child finally learns that it cannot assume that they're going to receive a, a benefits of parents that are generous and give you all things until they realize that there has something to do with our conduct. Some things have to be earned or merited. So a servant heart. What's a, why a surrendered heart? This servant heart. Let me, under the same surrendered heart, give you a couple thoughts. It promotes reverence before God at the throne of grace. Reverence is the main word there. It promotes the idea that uh, we are nothing. We are empty. We are worms. And we, as the uh, as a maiden reaches up and waits for the food from the master, from the mistress, to give what is necessary. I'm always intrigued by, I call them, early morning birds that squawk and sing, neck stretched out straight up. I just say that they're praying. They're looking for asking God to deliver a lizard or a bug or a worm. But it's that looking up. It's kind of like a picture that helps me understand 
the concept of reverence. We look up to the Lord. We are not equal with God. We are not on par with God. We don't sit around a big table as family members with God, servants. Elijah did not say, I am a, I am a child. He didn't say, I'm part of your family. Uh, treat me with royalty from the king of all kings. He chose the lowest life, the life of a servant, a slave. So we could say, uh, I am your slave. And I alone do all these things at your word. So a servant heart promotes reverence toward God, and a servant also prays with gratitude. Because sometimes we're, we lack the thanksgiving. But praying with a sense of gratitude, thankful and grateful that wh whatever we have, whatever God has given, the blessings, you made it to church this morning, there should be great gratitude for that. Some people can't make it. Some people are in the hospital. Some people are ill under the weather. Then there are accidents and tragedies. So every time in the state of Florida, our turnpike system, when you get to your destination, build an altar. <laughs> it was an act of God. We, just, we know that. It's a dangerous world. Patch the Pirate used to say, it's a jungle out there. And then a servant's heart seeks God's interest. So not only does he uh, have reverence and gratitude, but he has God's interest as his own interest. And then we look at a second thought, a faithful heart. Not only is he surrendered as a characteristic of a, a fervent prayer warrior surrendered, but very faithful. You see, a faithful heart is necessary. Elijah could say, at your word, I have done these things. In other words, I have consistently obeyed the instructions and the revelation that you have given to me. That should become our character. That should be, God should look at any one of us and say, you're known for your consistency in your walk of faith. Now, yep, we have our trip falls and stumbles. That is true. But we should be able to pray as David prayed with a note of confidence, remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept your commandments. Psalm 119, verse 22. Then verse 31, it says, I have stuck to thy testimonies. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30. Them that honor me, I will honor. 1 John chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. For if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence toward God. So you see all these texts of Scripture, what they're teaching us is God recognizes a faithful heart and a faithful individual that knows he is true to, the, to God. John tells us that we should have a heart that does not condemn us. Now, there's always going to be an element of guilt. Why? Because we're not perfect, and we cannot keep all of the law and the commandments. And all. But when we're hard at it, and we are consistent in uh, prayer, confession, devotion, and the things of the Lord, obedience, best that we can within our power, by God's grace, all of that, then yes, we should be able to say, my heart is not condemned. And I have confidence. So, look at it this way. A surrendered heart is necessary because we submit ourselves to the authority of our king. A faithful heart is necessary because it demonstrates our consistency in laboring for the king, for the Lord. And then we could add, but out of 1 John, a confident heart is one that knows that his heart is right by virtue of his righteousness, not imputed, but his lifestyle. He lives for the glory and honor of God. In that same text, verse 21 speaks about confidence toward God, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments, and we do those things which are pleasing in his sight. That doesn't require a sermon. It speaks for itself. Let's draw together the conclusion. Answer prayer or effective prayer most obviously requires ongoing preparation. 
That means this. Are my, is my communion time, is a communion time that I have, does it merit God's favor? Does it merit God's favor enough that he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer those prayers. You spend morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice, just as Elijah, and it came to pass at the time of the evening sacrifice that Elijah prayed. It's interesting. Maybe he waited for that time, but that's what he did. Secondly, when we talk about preparation, we check out our communion time. Is the glory of God our chief concern, or is it just have that prayer answered? Now, Wednesday night, we talked about this in a little bit more detail. Certainly, we are all interested in living souls, breathing people coming back out of the bed of affliction. We do want those things, and that is not wrong to desire that. Jesus addressed that when he said, give us this day our daily bread. And so he spoke to that issue. But at the same time, this is within our heart, Lord, heal, raise up, good surgery, safety in our travels, so that in the end, you might know, that people might know that thou art God of Christianity. That's important. Is the glory of God, honor of God's name. And then our last thought is, do we have a clear conscience before God? That's the deal breaker. Do we have a clear conscience before God? That's what God wants us to work on. Why? Because we keep and we do Whatsoever we ask, we will receive. Well, it's serious times. These are urgent times. And these are times for fervent prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate wasting time. I hate spinning my wheels. Part of the reason I just don't care to go to Pennsylvania right now is because they have snow. And one of the characteristics of snow is you get nowhere fast. You're spinning your wheels, emitting energy through the transmission and the car, and you're going nowhere. And sometimes we can be spinning our wheels in our prayer life. If I could take us back to the state of Pennsylvania in snow, you prepare for that with chains and studded tires so that you can move forward. If we don't want to be spinning our wheels and wasting our time in prayer for things that are urgent, if we want to see results, then we must have hearts that are serious, we prepare, we commune, we look for God's honor, and we pray with confidence, with servant faithfulness hearts. Can we do that? That's our challenge for today. Let us pray together. Father, we do ask that during this season of darkness and trials that are happening in many people close to us, very close to us, we do ask that our prayers not only would be heard, but the condition of our heart and the nature of our prayers would exalt you, and we would be satisfied, always satisfied, as part of our character with what you do in our lives. Help us to pray like Elijah. We may not be able to bring rain or snow or sunshine but there are some things, Lord, that you do do, and we, and we expect to see it, but only if we pray according to your word. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen.